Okay, so here we are today on, uh, what day is it, Tuesday, the 11th of June, 2024, and today we transition from the days of Hazel into the day days of Apple. So I'm just going to bring up my PowerPoint presentation for the days of Apple. There's quite a lot to talk about in this one, and as always... I kind of put my pictures together, but I'm not reading a script. So I'm just, as I think about things. So <clears throat> um, this year around the Grove, we've been looking at gods and goddesses, and that's the main focus for this presentation, which goddess, uh, goddesses correspond with the apple tree and gods as well, but really, uh, no spoilers, but it's pretty much goddess orientated, the apple tree. Um, but we will look at classical law as well, because it does bridge a gap between two realms. And that's kind of a theme with the talk, if you like. So the apple tree concludes the second acma. And I've been thinking lately that the, the last tree of each ACMA is kind of the zero point for the following ACMA. So, for instance, the first ACMA could be seen as following the winter solstice with the yew tree. Then you've got the first ACMA. And um, the second ACMA was born with the salmon's leap after the spring equinox with the ash tree. So the, the what I call the conclusion trees, which are the the trees with five strokes, um, set up the following acma. So the apple tree concludes the second quarter or acma, but it's setting up the third quarter or acma as well. Um, just quickly. Uh, if you're interested in basic law for the apple tree, look at the Owen Grove YouTube channel for Apple Tree 2022. So 2022 was our year for looking at all the basic law. And if you're interested in herbalism, medicine of each tree, that's 2023. So you can put Apple Tree 2023 if you want to go over our study of the medicinal value of the apple tree. So... Um, this year, 2024, gods and goddesses. So the days of the apple tree, you can see here, correspond with um, roundabout now, obviously, which is the 11th of June. Um, but it's the last nine degrees of Gemini and the first nine degrees of Cancer, the crab. And the, the space between Gemini and Cancer, the crab, is the summer solstice. So apple is balanced on the summer solstice. Each tree has 18 degrees. It's two nines. So again, apple is nine degrees Gemini, which tends to be masculine in star law. Um, and nine degrees Cancer, which is feminine in star law. And I'll go over that. So there is a kind of liminal balance between male and female, if you like. But also that solstice point is really important, as as important as the rebirth of the sun at winter solstice, you know. So this summer solstice moment is the, the final rising of energy up to the pineal gland, uh, up the spinal cord, and then there's descending energy. So having think sap risen is then going to energy of the trees is going to start descending back down into the winter solstice again. So it's a bit depressing, but we're only, gosh, 10 days away from the summer solstice. And we've all been saying it's not that warm, um, but that's just to do with daylight hours. July and August can be very warm, of course. So, um, Apple concludes the second acma, um, which goes from Hawthorne through Oak and Holly, the space between Oak and Holly being Beltane, 
and then after holly the hazel and then into apple herself and uh, the law of the apple tree very intriguing and it's mainly to do in celtic logic with the goddess of sovereignty um and there's something intriguing about the oem and the letters of the oem and the placement of the letters of the oem um which i'm saving to the end because it's a bit of a oh my god um or oh my goddess uh, uh revelation which i only realized a couple of months ago so anyway on this one on this chart you can see apple at 12 o'clock um so the first nine degrees of apple until the summer solstice have that influence of mercury which we've touched on with the hazel tree uh, and in classical deities that was the gods mercury and hermes and then the second half of apple is the goddess diana artemis because you go into cancer the crab cancer the crab is governed by the moon so it's the only zodiac sign that is governed by the moon. So the, the kind of astronomical influences upon the apple tree at, at summer solstice are Mercury and the moon, the reflective mind, rather than the sun. The sun is going to come with Leo and Broom and so on. Um, but that's classical star law attributes, if you like. Um, it seems... The evidence seems to suggest that the Celts or the sovereignty goddess as a summer solstice goddess and a very golden uh, goddess. Um, as much as Robert Graves um, looked for a moon goddess in, in the book, The White Goddess, who's kind of following his moon uh, ideas, the evidence for Celtic goddesses is more solar than, than lunar. Not saying they aren't there aren't lunar ones, but predominantly they're heavily golden and solar and their sovereignty rather than a dreamy moon goddess something. Sort of um, so Apple is holding that position, and it's really quite powerful. Some of the things that relate to the position of summer solstice and the goddess of sovereignty. Um, just before we move on to that, I'm gonna dwell on the nine degrees the last nine degrees of gemini and that last mercurial influence so we looked at this chap um in the last session to do with the hazel tree because he's a hermes figure from southern gaul but he's holding apples in his cloak and i just love that little touch um that he's a mercurial figure but he's holding apples and so the days of Apple have the last days of Gemini, Mercury, and here he is with apples hidden in his cloak. So it's kind of suggesting that connection, if you like, between Mercury and apples. From uh, a later medieval stories, um, through Irish and Welsh mythology, we can look at, grasp as best as we can, the old Celtic stories. But, all, but, they, but what happened then is around the 12th century and 13th century, Christian medieval Europe started creating romances which we call Arthurian romances. And they kind of took some of the old Celtic lore and retold it in a way that was acceptable to Christian audiences. So the main mercurial figurehead for all of that is Merlin. Merlin kind of represents this bridge, if you like, between the old ways and the modern ways you know although those modern ways are not the sixth century of Arthur but the 12th century of the audience that wanted to hear stories about Arthur so that their, their medieval romances and Merlin becomes the the figurehead for anything magical so he's a Gwydion he, he's Odin he's Lou and Lugus you know all, all of those mercurial wizards are almost 
in Merlin as an archetypal wizard Gandalf representing the, the pre-Christian ways that existed before Christianized medieval Europe. <clears throat> Merlin will be relevant shortly on. Um, the main, yeah, I'll come to it when I come to it. <clears throat> so I'll give you a moment to look at this star map. It's where we are now. If you look towards the bottom, you'll see a, a, a curving arc of a circle done with dashes. And note that dashed circle is the sun's ecliptic. And so on one side, you can see Gemini and the twins are there right in the middle, Castor and Pollux, they're the twins of Gemini. And then to the left of Castor and Pollux is Cancer the Crab. Now, Cancer the Crab, although the sign is named after Cancer the Crab, it's actually a very tiny, difficult to see constellation. Um, but the section of that part of the sky was named after Cancer the Crab. Um, the more dominant constellation for that part of the sky is Hydra, the water serpent. You can just see the head of Hydra, the water serpent, underneath Cancer the Crab. But Cancer the Crab is on the sun's ecliptic, whereas Hydra is below it, sort of thing. So the, that portion of the sun's ecliptic was named after the tiny, tiny, tiny constellation of Cancer the Crab. And then on the far le left at nine o'clock, you can see the constellation of Leo is on the ecliptic. So the days of Apple then are this space between Gemini and Cancer the Crab or, or, or Hydra the Water Serpent, you know, because like I say, Cancer is not so visible. <clears throat> when we do the days of Vine, the next tree, um, our focus on Hydra, in more detail because vine is completely cancer the crab so that's when we have a good look at hydra the water serpent but hydra the water serpent kind of carries on its back leo the lion crater the all-important cauldron wine mixing cup and corvus the crow basically the hydra the head of the hydra is the entire sorry the the head of the hydra to the tail of the hydra is the entire third acma. It's quite interesting. So it starts at Cancer the Crab, and the tail of the hydra is in Libra with Elder at Autumn Equinox. So that whole serpent is the third acma. Now, directly above the head of hydra on the Milky Way are the three birds, the summer triangle. And that's the main kind of symbolic constellation for the summer solstice, for the summer queen, um, is these three birds. Um, on the right-hand side is the summer triangle there. <clears throat> um, they made the three bright stars, um, uh, Deneb in Cygnus, Altair in Aquila the Eagle, and uh, Vega in Lyra. There's a recurring motif. The summer stars are this triangle of three bright stars known as the summer triangle, symbolized as three birds. Um, in poetry, Taliesin says, I have come from the region of the summer stars. You know, the region of the summer stars is, are the three birds of, of Rhiannon, if you like, you know. Uh, which relates to obscure Welsh poetry and Uspeth Adden Pengower and all of that. So for the last nine degrees of Gemini that take us to the summer solstice, uh, we touched on this um, in the last session as well. Um, this was the story of Lou throwing a spear into the eye of Balor, which is the star law pattern, if you like, around Beltane in the days of Holly leading up to the summer solstice. And at the end of this story, when Balor is defeated, glittering in the gloom, in the darkness, is a shimmering light of some sacred metal. And Lou reaches down and grasps what turns out to be a magical sword 
and this sword known as the sword of Tethra, and I don't know what that means, um, is given to Ogma. Ogma, the word wizard, the, the inventor of the Oum, is given this magical sword. Uh, and of course, Gemini leads us to that summer solstice moment. So uh, the treasure of the second Akma, if you like, seems to be this sword that is won or achieved from the abyss after the destruction of the forces of darkness. You know, um, Ogma holds it triumphantly. But going back to Merlin and the important importance of a sacred magical sword and the significance of the days of Apple and the realm of Apple, you know. So this thing we visited many times, this is the Mithraic rock birth from Hadrian's Wall. It predates Arthur and Merlin. This is fourth century Roman Britain. Arthur and Merlin are of the fifth and sixth century. So these kind of Roman star law motifs were inherited by people like Taliesin, Arthur and Merlin. Now, the important thing in this is that on the left hand side, the figure's right hand, but to us looking at it on the left hand side, the figure is holding up a sword just past the twins of Gemini. Very interesting, this sword at the Gemini cusp between Gemini and Cancer, especially when we've just seen Ogma winning a sword in the days of Gemini. The sword that Mithras holds points to the cusp between Gemini and Cancer the Crab, which is the moment of summer solstice. So with the Ogma story of the sword of Tethra, and the Mithraic mysteries of Mithras with his sword um, is pointing to summer solstice. Now, in Arthurian romances, then, remember, these are the medieval Christian retellings of older mysteries. So the most famous one, of course, is the one that relates to Merlin, you know, and that's Merlin helping Arthur to achieve Excalibur. And in the first story of Excalibur, the sword, the history of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth, it says specifically that his sword, Caliburn, was forged in the Isle of Avalon. That is, the, the sacred sword of the king came from the realm of apples. So that's quite intriguing having already observed a magical sword with Ogma in Gemini and Mithras pointing to summer solstice with his sword. And now King Arthur's own sword is coming from a place of apples. Now, obscure medieval grail romances, which, which is Merlin or Merlin's the figurehead for the magic that occurs in those things. Um, on the right here is an illustration for another oracle deck that I've done, which is coming out this summer. It's called The Well Maidens of the Summerlands. I, I did all the artwork a long time ago. It's just taken a long time to get published. But the, the reason I'm showing this picture is because the Gemini twins are there. On the left, there's a white bearded man. And on the right, there's a dark bearded man. They're actually brothers. And it might be a surprise to people that aren't familiar with the writings of Geoffrey of Monmouth. But on the left is Sir Gawain, and on the right is Sir Mordred. Gawain and Mordred are brothers in the first stories. The stories change by each storyteller. But in the history of Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth, um, Gawain and Mordred are both sons of Anna. Anna is the sister of Arthur. So Anna is sitting here as the queen of Lothian, you know, which is the original version according to Geoffrey and Monmouth. Now, between the two twins, between the two brothers, um, is a sword. 
And that's quite deliberate. It's deliberately the, the sword corresponding with Gemini, the twins. Now, too much to go into in a great bit of detail, but most people are familiar with the Holy Grail story. And in the and in the first romances, it's Sir Percival that has to go and find the Holy Grail. Um, it's the sacred cup or vessel. Um, but equally in the romances, there are other special magical items. They're known as grail hallows, sacred things, holy things, hallowed, uh, the, the grail hallows. Um, <clears throat> and one of them is the sword that decapitated John the Baptist, you know, so it's really complicated, but the medieval mystery traditions of France and Germany um, had kind of repackaged pre-Christian Celtic summer king, winter king ideas and packaged it in a biblical way. So from ancient Ireland, there were four special treasures. There was the sword of Nuada, which is sword of Tethra, the one that Ogma's got, um, the spear of Lu, the cauldron of the Dagda, and the stone of destiny. They were the four treasures, if you like. And then in Christianized medieval stories, the, those four treasures are given to Jesus and John the Baptist. Now, after a solstice, there's three days standstill, and then the length of day is noticeably different. So after the winter solstice, which is usually around the 21st of December, add three days standstill, takes you to the 24th or 25th of December, and that's the rebirth of the sun, the winter king's time. And Christians decided that Jesus was born on the 25th of December. And that's not in the Bible. It's not in the New Testament anywhere, Jesus's birthday. So it was in the early centuries that Europeans decided that, you know, 25th of December was the right time for Jesus's birthday. It is based on Roman stuff. Um, but in the romances, the medieval romances, the two treasures of Jesus, the two treasures of the winter king, are the cup that caught his blood and the spear that pierced him in the side on the on the cru crucifix so you get a spear and a cup in the gr grail stories of king arthur and they're all to do with sir percival has to find the sacred treasures of the winter king now with the summer king the birthday of John the Baptist is the 24th of June, three days after the summer solstice. Again, that's not in the Bible anywhere, but, you know, European Christians decided that the 24th of June, summer solstice, um, three day standstill is the time for the birth of John the Baptist. And he gets the other two grail hallows. So that is the sword that decapitated John the Baptist and the platter that his head was put upon. It's all very complicated, but basically you've got a spear and a cup for the winter time and the sword and a platter with John the Baptist at, at summer solstice. Yeah. Get lost with all of that kind of thing. So the sword though then becomes the symbol of the summer solstice time. And um, once you've got that kind of basic code, I suppose, um, you can read the medieval stories and understand why Sir Gawain is looking for the John the Baptist treasures and why Sir Percival is looking for the Jesus treasures. And, and there's a lot of esoteric complications in all of that, things to explore at a later date or not. You know, it's just the, the, the old Celtic 
stories were retold into our theory and romance. So to try and make sense of our theory and romance, that's a key for doing it. Anyway, um, the summer queen, all of that related to the nine degrees of Gemini and the sword. So now after the nine degrees of Gemini, we come to the summer solstice moment itself, which is the summer queen. Um, she has many, many, many different names, of course, most famously in Southern Ireland. A lot of these goddesses are localised to specific areas, and I'll try and remember to say which areas they belong to. Um, so Anya is a well-known summer solstice goddess of Southern Ireland. That's her tribal territory, if you like. So you get different goddess names at different locations because of different tribal territories and tribal versions of sovereignty or versions of Summer Queen. Um, the main thing with Summer Queen is she's the land itself and the golden light of the land and the colour gold is really important. And any would-be king or chief or leader of people would symbolically have to marry her that there was some sort of divine union or marriage between the people and the land they lived upon, if you like. And that was played out with a sacred marriage. And there were all sorts of strict rules that the king would have to live by if he was to be a good king or be deposed and got rid of. You know, a lot of all of this sovereignty stuff is pre-Christian. It was quite sexual. And it was frowned upon by the church and pretty much all but erased by the church as well. Um, <clears throat> the importance of the days of Apple hold um, the summer solstice, which is one part of the sun cross, which is you can see here on the left, directly opposite winter solstice, which is the days of you. Um, more importantly, on the right, uh, esoterically anyway, for the Venus influence. Um, the days of Apple anchor the Rose family pentagram. So the Oum has this pentagram of Rose family trees anchored on Apple at summer solstice. So it's a Venus influence as well. Um, and that interlaces with the evergreen pentagram, which is anchored on the yew tree at winter solstice, um, nematona. So there's this union, but this union of um, the Rose family pentagram and the evergreen pentagram is really important as a glimpse to sacred marriage as well. So we know it in this diagram and it's a really, really important piece of the Owen Grove um, I used to tiptoe around it, not wanting to offend anyone using the 13 tree system of Robert Graves. And, and I'm not criticizing Robert Graves. I actually like a lot of the white goddess. I think his uh, exploration through classical mythology is brilliant. I do. Um, but the 13 tree system, he chose to have 13 trees, which meant he had to drop seven of the 20. And when he dropped seven to just have 13, he lost Apple and you, which just, it's a screaming shame because when you use all 20 trees, the apple and the you are winter solstice and summer solstice. And more important than that, there is traditional Irish folklore, bardic law about the apple tree and the yew tree. So to, to have a system where there's no apple tree or yew tree just seems crazy now, really, you know. Um, I won't go into it. I've, we've looked at it elsewhere, but there were two young lovers, a prince and a princess. He was from Northern Ireland. She was from Southern Ireland. Um, they were a bit like Romeo and Juliet. They both died believing the other one had died um, tragically. And from her grave, an apple tree grew. And from his grave, a yew tree grew. grew. And the two trees inter 
wove with each other or took on the appearance of each other. There's two two versions of the story. They slightly differ. Um, but where they both agree is that I think it was around about the 4th century or 5th century, um, wood was taken from the apple tree and used to make wooden tablets. And the same with the yew tree was taken to make wooden tablets. And all of the love stories and marriages, sacred marriage, unions between nobility, kings and queens and so on, of Southern Ireland were inscribed in Oam on the apple tablets and inscribed in yew uh, uh, on the yew, yew tablets for Northern Ireland. So Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland kept their own archives of Owen writing, if you like. Eventually, the Apple tablets and the U tablets were brought together, and they might have been long wooden wands rather than a tablet, like a rectangle. They were brought together at Tara, the centre of Ireland, where the High King would marry the sovereignty goddess, and they flew together and could not be separated. This idea that these wooden wands of apple and wooden wands of yew were interlocked and could never be separated. It's so crucially significant to this Rose family pentagram and evergreen pentagram interlaced as they are right now. You know, it's a picture form of the story. It's a no brainer. Um, so that's there just as a natural organic pattern in the Owen Grove. And I think it's one of the best patterns in the Owen Grove, apart from what I'm going to show you right at the end. <clears throat> so I was first made aware of the Summer Triangle decades ago. There's in a church in Somerset just off the Glastonbury Zodiac Territory. There's a church called Stokes of Hampden, and above the entrance to the church is this. And on the left, you've got Sagittarius, and on the right, you've got Leo the Lion, and above the Lion, you've got the Lamb of God. It's a representation of Aries. So Sagittarius, Leo, and Aries are the three fire signs. And this dates back to the 12th century. Uh, in between them is this tree with three birds on it and so I've known for a long time decades maybe 30 years about the summer triangle um, the three birds are Cygnus the swan Aquila the eagle and Lyra the harp which is often a, a smaller bird um, and that's a well-known thing of Celtic star law now you know but again it's a represented in medieval church iconography but the summer triangle relates to the summer solstice. So it's therefore of the summer solstice goddess. And on the Gunderstruck cauldron, there's a female figure depicted with the three birds. There's two big birds, one on each side of her, and she's holding a little bird on her hand. So you've got Cygnus, a swan, the quill of the eagle, and then a tiny little bird for Lyra, the harp. Um, now, those three birds of the summer triangle in Welsh law are the three birds of Rhiannon. Rhiannon is a sovereignty goddess like Anya. Anya belongs to Southern Ireland. Rhiannon belongs to Southern Wales. You know, she's specifically the Pembrokeshire area of Southern Wales. And when she's first described, She's not specifically described as a summer queen like Anya is, but she rides a white horse and she wears a golden dress. So the gold itself represents that summer queen thing. <clears throat> and, um, and then, of course, her, her main motif being the three birds of Rhiannon uh, recurring. Um, so the summer queen has the summer triangle. She has the three birds as her main motifs. And um, in Ireland proper, I guess, Middle Ireland, the county of Meath, which is the centre point 
of Ireland, the sovereignty goddess there is called Maeve. Okay, spelt in a variety of different ways. By the time you get to Shakespearean English, it's Mab, Queen Mab, Queen of the Fairies, you know, but her original Gaelic name is M-E-D-B, although there are variations of spelling her name. Maeve is how it's pronounced. And um, so at Tara, the High King of Ireland would have to marry the sovereignty goddess and there would be a whole sacred marriage union about all of that. And Maeve was the recurring sovereignty goddess of the centre of Ireland. And her name is related to the alcoholic drink made of honey, mead. So Maeve means honey or honey drink or taste like honey or as sweet as honey or maybe because of the alcoholic drink she who intoxicates you know but she, the thing is she's the sovereignty goddess and she's honey and honey is gold like amber of course you know it's, it's this golden goddess thing um and of course once you marry Rhiannon or Maeve or Anya, you've got all the gold and riches of the land, you know, and in some places like in Rhiannon's territory, there li literally were gold mines. And in the Mabinogion, when the R R Roman emperor sees Ellen of the Ways, her costume, she's dripping in gold and her father is carving golden chess pieces and stuff, you know, so there's this constant emphasis on gold. So, Here's the thing I discovered recently, maybe a couple of months ago. Just as the first Akma is born following the winter solstice, um, so then the third Akma is born following the summer solstice. And each Akma has a first letter. Of course, you know, so the first letter of the first Akma is B for Birch and so on. So if you take the first letter of each Akma following the summer solstice, you get Maeve. That blew my head off when I saw that. M for Vine, A for Pine, B for Birch, Huatha, H. So the first letter of each Akma spells the name of the sovereignty goddess of the center of Ireland. That's quite, that's insane. That's mad. And then even weirder is the second letter of each Akma following summer solstice spells gold. And that, that makes no sense whatsoever because gold isn't an Irish word. It's not a Gaelic word. It's just a mad pattern or is it i don't know you know as far as i could gather googling online gold is a medieval english word it's not the irish gaelic word for the golden metal but it's just a weird pattern you know is it pure coincidence that the first letter of each akma after summer solstice spells the name of the sovereignty goddess and then the second letters that lead up to Luna Sir Sawain in bulk and Beltane spells gold. I don't know. You know, the, the, the written evidence of the Oum goes from 1390, the Book of Ballymoke. So there could have been a medieval English influence. I don't know. It's just intriguing. Anyway, something to talk about. With the dryads that I'm creating i am putting bits of detail into them that are there for the initiated if you like so i've just finished or last week i finished the dryad for apple now there's a story in ireland of seven treasures being won on behalf of the god lu it's a bit like how kiluk won olwen that there's a list of treasures that have to be achieved and these are to make amends to Lou for the murder of his father so Lou puts this challenge 
on three brothers called the Sons of Turin, and they have to find seven treasures. Um, that's Lou's punishment, if you like. Anyway, one of the seven treasures that they have to achieve on behalf of Lou, impossible treasures like the 12 labours of Hercules, is one of the things he demands are three golden apples from a, from a mystical island, a bit like the Hesperides or even Avalon. You know, I can't remember the name of it in Irish, but it's a mystical realm where there's a golden apples. Um, and he demands three of these golden apples. Um, so bearing in mind the summer triangle, the three birds, and now three golden apples, in the story, the three brothers go off and find this mystical realm and they realize that the place is too well protected. And the only way they can figure out how to get the apples is they turn themselves into birds. So the three brothers become three birds who fly to this apple realm and each brother grabs a golden apple. So the three golden apples are won by the three birds on behalf of Lou. You know, but it's it's all their realm of apples, three birds and so on. So anyway, I'll put my presentation away and you can put your microphones back on and we'll talk about some of those ideas. Wow. It's a great deal of knowledge and wisdom there, Yuri. Incredible. I'm 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 very insecure about a lot of it because I'm still discovering patterns and I kind of think, oh, that can't be real. Surely it's stupid, you know. But um, Mave, M-A-B-H, um, being the first letters, that's amazing. Yes. Can you take us through that in a the, the little bit more detail? Can you just go through the vine and vine pine and with the gold as well? Can you just get, um, clarify that, please? Just take us through the actual... Yeah, so the, the Yoam's divided into four quarters. They're known mm -hmm. as Akma, which which is just, it's a bit like the word clan. It just means a family or a group of things. So it's just a nice <laughs> Gaelic way of saying four groups or four, four families. Okay. Um, so the first quarter begins with birch, which is the letter B. The second quarter begins with hawthorn, which is the letter H. Um, the third quarter begins with Muin, the vine, the grapevine. And the last quarter begins with Aim, pine tree. So following the moment of summer solstice as a starting point rather than the winter solstice, the, the third acma begins with M. And the fourth acma begins with A. Mm -hmm. And the first acma begins with B, so that's Mab. And then the last acma begins with H, which gives it, makes Mab a V sounds like Mav, Mav. BH, BH in Gaelic is a V sound. So you would say Mav um, or Mav, um, regional dialects, different spellings. You know, things weren't written down in any, things were written phonetically until 1800s. But to get that, pattern you've got to go third quarter fourth quarter first quarter second quarter no. yeah so it, it starts with the third quarter it starts after the summer solstice yeah yeah and where's the gold one where's so, so that's starting from the summer solstice as well the second letter of each quarter spells g-o-l-d right yeah and, and i've looked second. I've looked for other four-letter words with the other letters, and I can't see anything there. So it's just Mave and Gold. It's just a wonderful... In the same order, third quarter, fourth quarter, first quarter, second. Yes, yeah. So, I mean, it's just... Yeah, yeah. Is it deliberate? Is it just a wonderful synchronicity? I've, I've no idea. Mm -hmm. Not a coinky dink. Yeah, or is the other world working with us right here, right now? Yes, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Always. Always. <laughs> so, yeah. It's not rational, but it's real. That we're yeah. in time, and we're also in eternity. So things yeah. that are happening irrationally are 
some product of the eternal realm. Franklin, am I teetering in the perilous realm? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Teetering is a good word for it. Henry, last year, did you talk about St. John's Wort? Um, I can't remember for the oh. summer solstice. I have, <laughs> yeah, I have maybe. Any. Yeah, maybe because of John the Baptist Day. Maybe we did. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, celebrate St. John the Baptist. These are mm. actually not the uh, herbal ones, but they're open right now, early this year for some reason, and they're bright yellow gold, you know, and it's all the same imagery that you're mentioning, and, and they're very beautiful. And they really their, are. This is their time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, of course, um, the summer king gets decapitated. You know, yeah. so at, as soon as you've got winter, summer solstice, it's declining energy, isn't it? Just mm -hmm. like winter solstice rebirthing energy. Mm -hmm. So the, the summer queen holds that position that from this moment onwards, that it's descending down. So. Yeah, and when you cut these, by the way, um, it's red, like blood comes out okay. of the plant. So there's another, yet another layer to that um with the whole medicinal and visual of these plants, the blood of cutting their heads off. Jim might know more about this than I do, but in English folklore, there's something called John Barleycorn. And yeah. John Barleycorn gets cut down. So that John might be John the Baptist, and it's to do with cutting and, and harvesting the crops. Yeah. <clears throat> Jim, do you There's know anything about John Barleycorn? Um, not a great deal. I mean, I'm, I know a couple of songs with him in it, but that's probably mm -hmm. as far as I'd go. There's all, the, there's all the Johns and Jacks, you know, Jack Frost and Jack O'Lantern and all these Johns and Jacks, and they're uh, very much related to this uh, cycle of the seasons and the, the you know, the king uh, being... The, the, the sovereignty goddess doesn't change for the cycle as much as the masculine... It goes through all these energies of being born as the seed and all that um, interesting connection. All of the John Barleycorn references I can think of uh, are really focused on beer. <laughs> than anything else. But is that a harvest thing? Do you wait for the crops and then make beer? Um, well, it's looked at as a separate crop um what's that hops no no oh. hops is something that came a lot later that's used to flavor it and preserve it but um the original beer was just made with um uh seeds like um barley um yeah i think corn, corn used to be used as a sort of a generic term for those seed crops like what we use to make bread and to brew beer. The Egyptians made a beer that was like bread. It's supposedly very thick and very viscous, thick, uh, yeasty stuff that we would not like. I did taste some once. Uh, it was pretty terrible. So they were they were the first barley, whatever, bread combination <laughs> beer people. Real stick to your ribs stuff, huh? Yeah. yeah. And the priests knew the secret of fermentation that was part of their yeah. sacred mysteries. And Osiris was the corn god that became the beer. Oh, you know, the John, uh, Johnny Appleseed, there's another John. He oh, yeah. was actually spreading those seeds because of cider, because uh, not to make beautiful apples for us to eat, but to make the apples for us to drink. So there you go again. Apple the apple seeds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's John. John keeps showing up. <laughs> so that there, there is a kind of alcohol thing. So Mave is mead and, yeah. and, and apples are cider, of course. And then the third acma holds that big cauldron for the big lunar ceremonies and festivals and stuff. You know, so it's got oh my that God. harvest time everything in the cauldron for the sacred marriage. So I, I almost see the second Akma as the young hero proving himself and winning the sword. Then mm. there's the summer queen. And then at Lunasa, there's a marriage um, with Ivy and Broom. 
and then you get nine months for a birth at Beltane with a Taliesin story. So that, yeah. So it's almost like the hero's proved himself to the summer queen and now there's going to be a sacred marriage in the third act, and it's all alcohol. Yeah, there's the vine with the with the grapes is yeah. in the third act. So there's it's a lot of a uh, lot of alcohol going on. Yeah, yeah. apples, spiked with any apples. Yeah, and it's vine spirit. will give you hallucinations. So more into the inner realm. I don't know much about bees, but bees came up with the willow tree in the first acma was the first nectar for the bees, but when would the honey be ready to make mead? Well, that's more from the cappings, and, and so it's well, more from the end of the season, yeah. Well, it's interesting, you know, because you know I keep bees, but I've never really been drawn to mead because I tried it years ago and I didn't like the taste of it. Um, Is it too sweet for you, Rosemary? No, I just didn't like. I love honey. Love the taste of honey. Rosemary, but I just didn't... Rosemary, when's honey ready? When when's the first batch? Well, of honey? now that's that's a good question because it all depends on the forage. Right. Now I have I have known years ago when we took off honey in April. Really, normally it's later. Mm -hmm. But it depends what they've brought in. Yeah. And if they have had a glut of something, like, for instance, say the lime blossom um, mm -hmm. or whatever, then it, it, it does vary as to when you can take it because they'll only use so much themselves. The rest of it is surplus, and that's what we get. So June is early as well. It's normally July. August and sometimes September. So there's, it depends on your bees and what they're bringing in. And how long would it take to make mead? About four months. Four months. I wouldn't know the answer to that because I've never made it. So it is a, it's a, a September months. roughly, isn't it? September time, mm -hmm. maybe September, October to have mead. What's so yeah. sad is that the honeybees are dying right now because in the summer and spring, uh, the dandelions are the first out, right? Dandelion. And the bees go to them automatically and we're spraying um, yeah. chemicals to pre-treat lawns and things of this nature that kill the weeds, but kill the food for the bees. So yeah. kill the bees, kill the bees well, themselves. Yeah. Well, yes. a weed, a weed is just a plant that's growing where a human being doesn't want it. There's no such thing as a weed. No, Everything that grows on this planet has a purpose. Everything. That, that, that's their intention. And, 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 and it is more, them. though. It is more the bumblebees that go after the, you know, after the dandelions. In it's my own personal experience. The honeybees don't seem to gravitate towards them. Um, so, but that's just what I've found personally. Whether they do, I don't know. Of spring, yeah. But when spring first pops out, the dandelions first pop out, and that's what the first food that they can go to. Yeah. You can do a dish like just shredding a apple and putting it in a dish and uh, putting a rock in the center, and the bees will come and drink of that. And it's wonderful. What sort uh, of bees are they, though? Are they honey bees? Are they, pardon? Honey. Honey bees. Mellifera. The the, yes. the honey bee. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's. I suppose again, that all depends on your area, and it does. what is you know what is being produced in that area. Different but countries. Have, rosemary. Um. Rosemary, you know, you the, have... what's it? The blackthorn is one of the early blossoms. Um, yeah. And the blackthorn, and then obviously you have some of the, maybe the apple blossom may be out as well fairly early. It all depends. It depends on your weather, and we've had awful weather this year. Yeah. <laughs> Rosemary, you have that wonderful classic English weather with the um, 
beautiful intermittent rains. And in California, we have absolutely no rain for months. So right now it's the blackberry flowers, for example. It's the only thing left that there's a large quantity for the bees. And you might not even think of that. Uh, at no, home. no, we've got the, we have got the blackberry flowers out at the moment. They are all out around the allotment, around the hedgerow. I've got mm. blackberries and also we've got comfrey they love comfrey um and all all of the all of the fruit blossoms they really like you see a, a bee will go where there is the quickest forage so if there's something that is really in flower they'll all go there so and then they'll go and tell one another where yes. the best forage is and they'll That's all make it always go and tell the bees <laughs> Yeah. And, and you can tell it's very interesting because all the different plants have different color pollens. So yes. when you watch your bees going in, you look at their pollen sacs to see what color pollen they're taking in. And it does vary from almost white to really dark brown, you know, sort of like dark orange and sometimes red. Yes. So it gives you an idea of where your bees are going, even if you haven't seen them, because you can get charts. You can look it up online. You get charts that show you the colours of the different uh, pollen. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. When, when, Notre Dame, when Notre Dame burned down, there mm -hmm. was a miracle, and that was that the beehives on the roof were saved, were spared. By nature. Yeah, Rather. nature really kind of knows her thing. It was something yeah, like, it's us that get it wrong, you know. Both yeah. collapsed, but the beehives didn't get didn't get hurt. That's surprising because they're made of wax and they are very, very good fire fuel. That's you know, that is a double miracle, really. Yeah. yeah. I love the pictures of the beehives that have no um that when they don't have a hive to do it, they make the greatest creations. Thank you, JJ. Thank you. Yeah. Great song. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Um, we better do our meditation. So I'll stop recording and you can put your microphones off for the time being. Mm -hmm.